This evening, uh, Francis and Jim are attending uh, the League of Women Voters Forum at 7 p.m. It's going to be covering the role and challenges of the East Hampton and South Hampton Town Trustees at the Hampton Library Community Room on 2478 Main Street, Bridge Hampton. Uh, Francis and Jim are part of the panel with two South Hampton Town Trustees, and they'll be discussing past public and uh, future issues in their mission as stewards of the waters and beaches. So anyone at home that would like to take a drive over to Bridgehampton tonight, they can listen into that discussion. Uh, Arlene, could you please do roll call? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, Rick Drew. Present. Bill Taylor. Present. Susan Vorpal. Present. John Aldred. Here. Brian Burns. Here. Susan McGraw-Keever. Here. Del Cullum. Here. Francis Bach, Jim Grimes, okay, seven present. Thank you. Okay, let's start with the uh, public comment portion of the meeting tonight. And first on the list is Mr. Zach Cohen. Good evening, Rick Drew and the trustees. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here for, well, I have numerous <laughs> small things to say as we approach probably, what is the exact date that the your public hearing is closing on deep water? Is it about the 16th? The 16th. 16th. 16th, okay, all right. So some of these things I, I'll write up more formally. Also, uh, some comments came back to me. I did formally submit the um, spreadsheet I did where I felt I had fairly well uh, uncovered uh, what was the, the likely Prices that were not being told in the in by Deepwater Wind is what the purchase power agreement is. Uh, so if there were questions on that, or if somebody wanted me to explain a little more, what I did, I'm happy to do that. Um, one thing I want to talk about just briefly that I see is I, I find an interesting topic is sort of what your purview is, and I can see that some. Uh, trustees and some people have addressed you feeling that it needs to be narrow and only that of like what effect is it on the actual trustee owned properties and then other people have have uh, wanted you to act more like gatekeepers for the whole community in the decision. It's, I, I don't wanna say that there's a right or wrong on this. I think that it's an interesting question and I don't think either pr any, somebody taking any side on that should necessarily be thought of as having made a wrong decision. I though personally see that in some cases when you are in a gatekeeper role and the importance of the decision rises to such as importance that I believe this does, I think it's totally valid to be thinking about what are the implications of my decision beyond say just the, you know, the land that I hold and things like that. And, but who are my customary uh, people who I represent and elect. So um, I personally would probably go in that in that line of thinking about I'm making a decision for the whole community and all the effects on the community. So bear with me if I do go into uh, certain aspects of that. Um, you know, I moved from about a year and some ago looking at uh, a lot of literature on um, the environmental effects and you can interrupt me. If you want to talk about the, the spreadsheet, I'm happy to do that. If you want to skip it, that's fine. If you want to email me questions on it, things like that, I might make a, a few brief comments. Um, one of the problems when you start looking at all the literature done in Europe and a few in the United States is that almost all of this, almost all the studies you say, but we need long-term studies. So it's a difficult situation in terms of deciding what really to weigh. But one of the ones, you may have some of these, I'm not gonna talk much about this, but one of the ones I felt there was, I felt most strongly about was um, if you had the, the study that was called uh, titled Negative Long-Term Effects on Harbor Porpoises from a Large Scale Offshore Wind Farm in the Baltic, Evidence of Slow Recovery. Um, I can send the whole, I just did the one page 
But this is one of the few long-term ones I found where uh, they found that uh, the harbor porpoises, I think it was in Denmark, where they came in and after uh, building the uh, wind farm, the, and it makes sense to me, the marine mammals will be sensitive and smart. It was down to 11% of what had been there before, and even 10 years later, it was only back up to 29%. Uh, it's one of the few long-term studies I found that you know I put some faith in. Um, I also, one of the uh, ones that's also very relevant, but it's hard to draw co exact conclusions on, uh, I had some correspondence uh, with a, a professor, Andrew Davey, at Sterling University, and he was part of a group who did a study on the effect of noise on cod, specifically on cod. And I, I can, you know, and I can, and y y I couldn't get the full study, so he sent it to me. Um, and here's the problem with studies like that. He, I think, very distinctly showed that allow, and we all know cod are s more sensitive to noise than many other fish, uh, and that's been established, but that it actually affected a stress response, which had affected the reproductive sperm and eggs, and that there were, it led to le lower fertilization. The problem comes is then, but I can't tell you, these are in somewhat controlled experiments. I can't tell you what would happen out in the ocean. Would the, would the cod swim away? If they swim away, would they come back? I mean, these things, but there are those risks out there, and I think it's a valid point to be thinking about them. Excuse uh, me, Zach, yeah. is it possible for you to send us the link to these articles I'll, that you have? I won't send you the link, I'm gonna send you the articles. Terrific, thank I'll you very much. I'll send you the actual full articles. Thank you. Yeah, and these are two of my favorites because I think one of them's long-term and one of them's so directly relevant to uh, the history of those fishing grounds um, and stuff. So, okay, moving on. Um, as, as some people know, then I, I more moved into the issue of two issues. One, what's, what's really the financial effects? And, even, and then now more even, how should we be planning uh, for energy decisions very quickly on that? It's, I'm not at all happy about it, but it seems that everything's a top-down decision, take it or leave it, as opposed to, you know, I would really like to see, uh, I'd like to see the individual towns working together. Uh, I'll go back to the financial. Uh, I sit there and I see like in Brookhaven on June 25th, there's gonna be a public hearing on whether they should build uh, a 600 watt, a uh, megawatt, 600 megawatt gas-fired plant that a developer put it up, like is not necessarily people behind this, but specifically says that they're gonna prove and they're gonna show that it's needed to supplement the, the wind and solar because wind and solar are intermittent supplies. <laughs> so, but I'm sitting there going like, and East Hampton is sitting there thinking about the wind and, and then this other town's thinking about the gas fire to supplement, but they really need to be thought of together so that I just, you know, it, it's so obvious to me, you do a simple model if, if you had an island and it needed exactly 90 megawatts every day and uh, you built something that was a replica of deep water wind to put out 90 megawatts on the best, obviously you would have to have to buy a gas fired or I mean a, 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 um, a natural gas fired or something uh, uh, alongside of it or else you'd have to five times overbuild with solar and batteries. I mean, if you, if you do any kind of modeling, you realize that what Europe has shown, if we really wanna look at Europe, is that uh, you, you build a lot of wind farms, you have a minor reduction maybe in your fossil fuel use, but it's, it's so intermittent, you would have to, on this island, you'd have to have a gas fired that produces 90 megawatts and you're now paying for both of them, <laughs> and you really have to start saying, is that the most efficient use of money for environmental causes? Um, so that's something that we could get really deep into, but it's, uh, uh, sadly, I don't see it bubbling up. Now maybe if we form, if people know what a CCA is, Community Choice Aggregation, we might get there. Uh, but one of the things that bothers me is um, this looks like a, top-down decision, take it or leave it, and it really should seem like 
there should be a, 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 a equal movement coming up where, where we've designed, this is what works for East Hampton, because per, personally, I would like to see, if, if I was said, oh, we have rising demand, which I think a number of us have shown, we don't think that's really true, but if I was shown there's rising demand, first thing I'd respond is say, oh, I'm getting too fat, I'm gonna lose weight. You know, and that that the, that I should be working on on behind the meter uh, solutions and and uh, more energy efficient building and more solar panels and everything like that. So you ended up making sure your demand didn't increase. So you don't need the peaker plants. Okay, and then going back on the um, on the finance side, um, all all I'll say is I can't outside of. Outside of Block Island, I can't see any wind farm development that is as expensive as this deep water wind is. And so it just doesn't make, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't remove the need for fossil fuels at, at a substantial amount. Uh, it could be more easily duplicated in other wind farms south of Long Island. Uh, if you're going to use, if you're going to develop um, uh, intermittent source green energy, w why would you necessarily pick one that is the exact, its efficiency is the exact opposite of your demand curve? Your demand curve, we, you've been through this. Your demand curve's in the summer, and this produces high in the winter. <laughs> and uh, now, if you combine the two, that's a kind of sensible thing, because if you had a situation where whenever wind was, bad solar was good, or whenever solar was good, wind was good. Now you start getting into an interesting combination that ultimately needs a lower com a lower percentage of use of fossil fuels to fill in because you've got that counterbalance that's evening out. But to, it's almost as if this is, if it really was just for here, it's too much. It's too much wind energy because it's not, you, when you have something like that that can be zero, what is it, in England recently, they went nine days without any of the wind farms producing? I think that's what it was. It went nine days recently with zero output from the wind farms. So you can't even cover that with batteries. So I, I, I am definitely very strongly, the more I studied it on the side that, you know, I would love to see and maybe the, the intelligent solution that we're also looking at, we meaning a few of people have spoken here, like Tom, I always pronounce his last name wrong, Broloff, Broloff? Broloff. Something, Berloff. you know, and Mike McDonald, some of the others, is, is that the best thing to do is um, see if the Article 7 hearing can be a place where um, there is what I would call now asymmetric information. Um, the <coughs> LIPA and that group holds, and Deepwater Wind holds a lot of knowledge. You don't have that knowledge, and it makes negotiating very difficult when there's asymmetric information. It's a classic thing. People have won Nobel Prizes in economics over this. Um, uh, uh, it's, it, and in fact, it started with a study called something like the, the market for lemons, referring to when you go buy a used car and there's asymmetric information, how many people get screwed, because <laughs> you don't really know if the car had been, been, you know, you don't have the information really. And I have a feeling that if we can get to that Article 7, and that's what I'm trying to study, that, and I know that you're taking a careful study too, um, that having an administrative law judge and other things there may may eliminate that imbalance, or at least not eliminate it, but, but reduce it greatly. And uh, no promises, but there are a number of us who are trying to investigate what would it cost and what, what kind of standing, what kind of group would we have to actually go there and have standing to talk there. Um, and that might be not just, that I wouldn't even consider that punting, I consider maybe that's the wisest, wisest place to go. So unless somebody has questions down, you know I'll take questions over the next few days on any of these things. Um, that's my piece and uh, I appreciate you listening to me. Is yeah. my understanding that there is built into Article 7 provision for funds? To we, a certain extent? I am only learning about this. I'm not, you know, almost all of us are asking somebody else, is this right, is this right? Mm -hmm. But I've been told more than once by two different people that yes, there are, yes, there is. 
it's not easy to go as an individual and get standing and legal representation, but if you go as some kind of even, even recently formed but bona fide organization, um, you put in, you, the more intelligent, knowledgeable you look, I suspect, you know, the harder it is to, to say no. And, uh, but is yes, there, that's my understanding. Is there something available for the town through the Article 6? I don't know about that. I was, we were looking at whether if, if we hired an attorney, could the attorney get paid? And I don't know the extent of it, but I was told yes. I just don't know to the extent what that yes means. Mm -hmm. But that, and somebody told you, somebody, you may know something. I think that money is set up in a way where um, there are the pot of money that can, can be used to help people in going through the process is uh, set up so that different kinds of organizations may have a shot at it, and one or kind can't, can't use the whole pot. I don't know if, if okay. municipal uh, governments or municipal corporations are guaranteed a certain portion. I don't know that. Okay. That's beyond me. But th yes, I understand. That's one of the things we're looking at, because it's not cheap. And I was told specifically, you, you, got, you, need, you need lawyers, you need lawyers who know what they're doing in mm -hmm. these things. Yeah. Okay. But we're looking into it. Thanks, Zachary. Thank you, Thank you so very much. Thank, Thank you. you. And <coughs> Appreciate it, Zachary. Okay. Kim? So if we have Kim Barber from the Cornell Marine Cooperative tonight to give us an update on a project she's working on. everyone. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. I just wanted to come uh, to give an update on two specific projects that we're working on uh, within the town of East Hampton. Um, both of these projects uh, require your support and hopefully approval uh, to go on to the next phase, so I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, the two projects in question um, are Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project that I came back in February to give an overview of. We're mm -hmm. ready to go uh, with some exciting updates, so we'll get into that. And then also um, our Acabonic Macroalgae Bioextraction Project um, that was funded by CPF that we're ready to hopefully move forward with as well. Um, so just to recap, um, our Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project, this is being made possible uh, by $10.4 million coming down through Governor Cuomo's office. Um, we're getting about $5.25 million of that to produce 115 million hard clams and about 40 million oyster spat on shells. Uh, obviously engaging the community um, in different efforts in support of this project is a big part of it as well. Um, so if you recall, one of the most significant aspects of this project involves um, identifying about uh, 70 different nursery sites. We need to put 70 of these floating upwiller units out there to support the grow out of our clams, because obviously we can't grow this much out at our um, specific facilities. So um, we called upon the local communities, uh, public and private marinas to come forward and see if they'd be willing to donate some dock space to house some of these. Um, we're gonna start deploying them, or we already have uh, in western areas, and uh, we're gonna do another round of them in 2019 as well. Um, so just quick update, um, I mentioned too, uh, we're doing construction at our hatchery, building a whole new state-of-the-art uh, facility there. We're almost operational there, we're getting there, uh, but for now we're operating our existing hatchery out at Cedar Beach in Southhold. Um, we've done a couple of clam spawns already. We're starting to work on our spout round shell work. And uh, the crunch time is now because our uh, clams are getting big enough that they need to move on to their uh, new home in these floating upweller systems. So um, our goal in year one, 2018 here, is to put out about 40 of these with the other 30 or so happening in 2019. Uh, so we actually put out, this is um, out in Huntington at, at Gold Star Battalion Beach where we have a little satellite hatchery. Um, and shellfish nursery there. We put our first two in the water there and uh, they're ready to receive clams that they'll be receiving in the next uh, week or two from what I understand. 
Uh, so uh, we're looking to kind of start west and move on east as far as our sites and getting them ready and getting um, the places ready to receive these. We're seeking permission uh, to install eight of these FLEPSI units at four different locations throughout the town of East Hampton. I'll show you a map here that just gives a little bit of, of scope and scale as far as the overall project. Um, we really wanted to uh, spread out these nursery sites uh, throughout Long Island to really try to get all the communities involved in hopes that, again, after the life of this project, we'll be able to continue efforts. So um, East Hampton was certainly one of our priority sites that we wanted to work with. Um, so we've identified several uh, locations on the east end here and then out in Montauk uh, that we'd like to work at. Uh, these uh, nursery sites are at uh, Sunset Cove Marina and Three Mile Harbor Marina in Three Mile Harbor. And then uh, the Lionhead Beach Association Marina up over by Hog, Hog Creek and uh, Montauk Yacht Club over in Lake Montauk. Um, so these are the four sites that we have uh, these MOUs memorandums of understanding uh, with uh, the actual property owners. So they are ready to go from a legal standpoint. We're just seeking approval to move forward with being able to have the permission to actually put them in the water. Um, and again, just to uh, recap, there's also a lot of different stewardship and educational opportunities that we wanna be able to provide as part of these projects. So a lot of these great partners that we're working with before that are identified are all interested in doing different community outreach things, um, doing some education projects. So we're looking forward to hopefully being able to um, deploy FLEPSIs in these areas and getting going with the work uh, in East Hampton town waters. So. Um, that's the first half of the presentation. I don't know if it's something that you want to consider and I could write formal correspondence and hopefully get some formal approval or if it's something that you have a quorum to do tonight. I'm not quite sure the next steps. One of the concerns somewhat similar to this, we're starting to hear as a community that there's this um, nursery uh, as it relates to oysters floating out in certain bodies of water and all of a sudden boats are like, coming up to them and there's no GPS and all that jazz. So, but these would be in what? Safer areas, exactly. non boating Exactly, yeah, you might be talking about the different, the aquaculture leasing, the commercial yeah. aquaculture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is different than that, um, as you saw in the photo in those other slides. They're about uh, 16 foot by 16 foot, I believe, and they're kind of designed to be able to fit nicely in a dock space or off of a bulkhead with two um, tie-off areas, so okay. yeah, these, these puppies are secure. They're not meant to be up in open waters. Um, the different marinas we're working with, sometimes it's an underutilized slip or a slip that's sure. a little bit um, silted in that they're not ut utilizing otherwise that have that access to the electric that we need to keep the pumps running. Um, so I don't foresee any navigational um, hazards. Again, uh, we're gonna have two technicians, teams of technicians uh, throughout each of those zones that you saw on that other map. We're doing this, you know, Long Island wide. Uh, so we'll have a dedicated team for our South Fork sites. We have some sites in Sag Harbor and uh, Southampton and Hampton Bays as well. So they'd be coming once or twice a week to do formal uh, maintenance on the units, to do different, you know, metrics, to clean the units, to sort the clams, to, um, you know, scale them out through the different barrels as, as we need to as we go along in this. So I don't foresee, you know, any issues with that. Uh, I don't either, and thanks for clarifying that. It's just people who may be listening, or gotcha. just just walked in from the bathroom. Yes. Floats? <laughs> We're yes. having problems now, but it's altogether different. It, yes. and I remember when Sunset Cove Marina owners, the Mendel Mendelmans came in, and they showed us on a map where the- Three Mile Harbor Marina. Oh, Three Mile Harbor, excuse me. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Three Mile Harbor Marina <laughs> showed us where the flop seas were going to be. Yeah, they were trying and to. And they're tucked away. Them. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So, and we don't want, you know, them accessible. They're gonna have signage, you know, on a piling and on the uh, unit itself, just uh, explaining what the project is. We don't want people, you know, going on and, and disturbing the clams, quite frankly. Uh, so, you know, there'll be a, a lot of signage and, and education as part of it too. This is maybe more a question for the board, but we did get approached by Three Mile Harbor Marina and asked to give permission. We gave formal permission mm -hmm. for this to occur. Never heard anything from the other marinas though mm -hmm. in Three Mile Harbor. Well, yeah, I was going to ask that we need to question. Know. Yeah. Do you have letters of understanding or support Absolutely. from these property owners? Yeah, so the same thing, you know, Three Mile, all these yeah. marinas, they have to, and I could send you, you know, the sample language of everything that it spells out. So everything from, you know, liability to co cooperation and all these different 
issues are spelled out in there and that's kind of part of our overarching DEC permit that we have to establish these nursery areas. So it addresses everything we need to, you know, on the state level, it's just the local level. You know, different municipalities have different ways they want to do this, but for the most part, they're all entrusting, they, they see this, you know, document that we have that, you know, it's a, a legally binding document that we could terminate at any time if something isn't going, you know, the way it should be going or if it's mm. posing a problem. So we're all set up, you know, to be able to account for that, but I could certainly send the board a copy of that MOU. My question, to adding to John's um, statement is, are the, should Sunset Cove Marina, Lionhead Beach Association Marina, and Montauk Yacht Club Marina also approach the trust, trustees for the same permit and permission that uh, Three Mile Harbor Marina yeah. did? Well, I think the issue with Three Mile, there was, there needed to put in a piling or a, there was another structure that needed for all of these. They're just going in the actual, you know, dock space themselves. So there wasn't any yeah. need to do that. I, but I'm wondering, uh, oh, and, and why is it that there's no need to do it, I guess, well, I'm, is my question. Per, perhaps one way to approach this would be, Kim, to put your package of documentation together, sure. send it to the trustee office for council to take a look at, yeah. and let the board reflect on it until the next meeting. I don't think it's going to be an obstacle, but I think we should do oh, I, I definitely. a basic review yeah, of yeah. the paperwork. Yeah, I'm, and I'm sure we're all supportive of it. It's yeah. just that we don't we want, want to follow to procedure. Definitely. Like full-on you know, permission from one, and then... Yeah. yeah, and I think to their credit, we never said, you know, they, we, you know, indicated we were handling the permitting, the permissions, everything, you know, they, ne it's not, you know, for lack of whatever, they just thought it's in our hands, we're the lead partner as far as doing this, they're just a site host, and there was, you know, different, you know, uh, an understanding of, of their, you know, roles and responsibilities and ours, so, you know, again, to their credit, it was, you know, I don't think they did it to be neglectful of it, we, you know, maybe then miscommunicated, and I should have approached you first to see you know how you wanted to handle that but we could always go back and do that now they're all super supportive i'm sure they'd be more than willing to come and, and represent you know themselves as site hosts as well also we we don't have jurisdiction over the montauk sites right right uh, so yeah that's right. uh montauk yacht club's a different scenario what about dc and other town permission is there any being required or has anybody asked for any yeah i mean permit? we're working really closely we've kind of have a blanket permit from dec um that again all these maps and all these mous are all part of we're identifying the areas that were it's a you know a shellfish nursery permit pretty much um that you know lists all these sites that we're doing work at as we get the mous finalized it goes on the list that goes to dec so they are you know they have jurisdiction over most of these sites and then towns, you know, town by town, not everyone has trustees for the most part. We're working with the lo local governments who have all been, you know, partners and supportive. So everyone handles it a little bit differently, but we're happy to, you know, make sure has, we're handling it correctly. Has East Hampton asked for any other, like a natural resource special permit for this or any other environmental permit? You know, town, not trustees. Yeah, no, I mean, I've been working closely with Kim. You know, she's well aware of all of this, and it was never indicated that we needed anything, you know, above and beyond. So I, I'm operating assuming that we don't, but I could, you know, double back with her just to be sure, too. Uh, like, we can ask her. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's great, Kim. Like I said, do send over the package, Definitely. and I think we can get okay. our thoughts together for the next meeting. Yeah, and we, we have time again. We're, you know, rolling from the West. Uh, out here, but we were hoping, you know, sometime in July to get them going. That's, you okay. know, July. Great, that gives us mm -hmm. ample time to, yeah. to review Absolutely, it. yeah. I Is everyone okay with yeah. that? Mm. Yep. Okay. Okay. Do, do the colors of the dots denote anything specifically? Um, yeah, that was more for our purposes that we kind of have like a stoplight system as far as, you know, we've identified, we, we screened all these sites based on everything from, you know, water quality to, you know, um, location and vicinity of the different sanctuary sites we had, you know, growth potential areas where we already had partners doing shellfish work. And then um, once the sites are green, it means that thus the, um, we have an MOU actually executed and we're ready to essentially deliver property. So um, most of those sites, you know, it's those North Shore sites that are mostly green. We have some still, you know, areas that are yellow. I believe one of the, no, I think we're all set with these Hampton sites. Um, but, you know, if we have the MOU out for signature and we're still waiting signature, it's yellow. And, um, red is area that we, you know, identified as somewhere where we'd like to work and then it didn't work out for whatever reason, the, you know, location wasn't suitable as we went to do our site visits and things like that. Yeah. You might thought I counted five dots. In the there, you were, you might have been counting. I wonder. I think one of them was red. Red 
so have I'm sorry, I have mine. Okay, so that was Lionhead, that was Hog Creek. We might still be awaiting a uh, signature on the MOU, but we have gotten um, you know, permission by their association and we're ready to move forward. But yeah, so if we don't have the MOU, I'm not handling that specifically. So um, if we don't have it in hand, it's technically red. There was another location in, in Lake Montauk as well that we were going to pursue, but it turns out we had ample, each one of the East Hampton sites wanted to host two, so we were kind of maxed out at our target you know, goal for East Hampton, so we kind of tabled that until you know, we might revisit it next year if we need to. Um, and that's another thing, it's kind of a rolling system. We're gonna see you know, how the clams grow at different sites too, and it might be that you know, someone's hosting something this year, it didn't work out for whatever reason, and we'd be you know, moving a dot for next year too. So this is really just the targeted sites we had for 2018. And as they're turning green, it means we're, we're good to go. But there's a certain shade of green, I guess, so we're good to go with the host, but we're not good to go uh, with the town yet. So it doesn't mean we're putting them in, uh, in East Hampton specifically, but we'll go through the proper protocol and hopefully get there soon. Are we ready to move on to seaweed? <laughs> All right, so uh, this is another project we have in the works that we're very excited about. Um, again, we've been working closely with uh, Natural Resources, um, Kim Shaw and her staff on this. Um, we submitted a proposal for funding and we got CPF board approval of this funding, so I'm hoping this is not the first you're hearing of this project, but if it is, um, that's why I'm here. So we uh, submitted Permits, as we usually do on you know federal and state levels, as well as you know needing to get our local permission above everything as well. So we've um, DC determined we don't actually need a permit for this. Um, USA Army Corps of Engineers, we needed something, but that's pending. So now I'm here to um, hopefully get approval from the trustees to approve or the same thing. We could do formal correspondence, and you could let me know. But um, just to backtrack a little bit about the project itself, so. Um, this is, and I, I think I mentioned this throughout meetings that I've been here previously as something that we kind of had in the works that we wanted to start looking at, you know, the potential of different macroalgaes um, for, you know, nutrient bioextraction. The Pussy's Pond and Akabonic Harbor complex was a, a candid area based on some of the groundwater, um, that submarine groundwater discharge work that we did and also the permeable reactor barrier that we put in that area. So our goal is to um, put out about 30 frames um, that are anchored down with bricks um, filled with either gracilaria, for the most part, that's the dominant species we're using, and there's a couple of cages that we wanna experiment with ulva as well. And um, basically, we're putting this out in areas that we've mapped are, are high um, nutrient inputs, and the goal is to every other week go out there um, take some of the samples and actually do nutrient analysis on them. So basically we're trying to get, um, you know, firm bioextraction data to see if, you know, this could be part of the, you know, nutrient solution um, as far as what we're doing, you know, land-based is, is a whole other issue. What could we also do at the shoreline to help, you know, filter out our waters as well. Um, so this is proposed to be a three-month project, so mainly in the, the summer months that are just about upon us here. And um, this is kind of what we're talking about here. So on the left here, we have um, the gracilaria that I mentioned. Um, that's that species over there. Um, that's predominantly um, the cages will, will be consumed with that. And then the, the ulva, uh, the green macroalgae, um, will be in some of the other ones along the shoreline. So you can see mean high water, um, where this is located. The ulva is closer um, to the more upland area. It could tolerate um, being exposed for a certain amount of time. So um, basically the goal is to you know, see exactly what the bioextraction uh, capability of these two species in this specific area where we know we have higher nutrient inputs as well is. So, um, you know, again, realizing I'm just presenting this now, it's not something I'm seeking approval for necessarily today, um, but we want to be able to hopefully um, this month or by early July be able to deploy these cages. Um, again, there's other um, community stewardship and um, volunteer and outreach uh, potential as part of this project as well. 
Um, we're also, as we did with our kelp aquaculture feasibility study that we did in the Baconics, we're trying to identify different beneficial um, reuses of this spent uh, macroalgae that will be, um, after we harvest it, what can we do with it? In the past, we've worked with different farmers who use it for compost tea and different organic um, treatments to their uh, soil amendment process, um, working with different chefs to use it as a culinary purpose, and uh, the list goes on, cosmetics, other things as well. So that's an overview, happy to uh, answer any questions related to it, but that's what we're hopefully seeking to do. You're probably aware of the project that the trustees and the town and other people are involved in in Georgia Capon, where there's a machine that's skimming algae and then it's taking it out of the pond. Mm -hmm. Is this the same basic idea that the, the seaweed will grow, utilize the nutrients, then the seaweeds will be taken out of the pond and therefore the nutrients will be exactly along the same yeah. lines. We're not trying to make you know Pussy's Pond and beyond chock full of this macroalgae. That's why it's in a cage system. That again, it will be removed from the system. So we are truly removing nutrients, you know, from the system by removing the actual macroalgae. Yes. So we're not trying to let this just grow freely everywhere. But um, we planned on using clippings from um, the actual water body itself too um, to basically repurpose them in this capacity. They're very um, as you know, prolific <laughs> growers, especially during the summer. So um, we envision every other week, you know, kind of flipping this out. Kim, how did you go about the site selection process? So it, it had to do with, you know, some of that initial work that we did looking at the submarine groundwater discharge and, and measuring for where there were high nutrients. Um, it was also, again, it was uh, in coordination a lot with um, natural resources uh, office to try to see too where the, the higher um, suspected problematic areas were and focusing on those areas where we think that it'll you know have the most benefit as far as honing on that area that needs the most bio extraction equipment. And did you illustrate that earlier in the presentation? I'm sorry, I didn't get a clear understanding of that. just from a seepage standpoint as far as where it's flowing the most, not even looking at the um, nutrient makeup of that uh, flow, but just more measuring where those hot spots of the water coming in are. So based on that, that's where we um, decided to site these areas. So now, that's next to the Springs General Store then? Yes. So John, maybe you could help me with this one. What is the status of that from a shell fishing perspective? Is that uh, a closed area or an open area? Yeah. Harvesting the shellfish? I don't think it's closed. I mean, Pussy Pond is closed. I'm not sure of the nature of that little creek. But I don't right. remember seeing Right, because, you know, we do have uh, other uses of the bottom land. Sure. You know, people are recreationally and commercially shell fishing in these areas as well. So have you given any thought to how yeah, this I might mean, coexist with those traditional uses? I think both of these areas, again, um, apologies, I could get back to my field team as well because they're the, the boots on the ground that had a better you know, site assessment that I know with everything we do, we look into all of that. We're you know, very pro you know, usage of our waters as well, so we never want to do anything that's going to inhibit that. But to my knowledge, um, there were some sediment issues and access issues, and it's quite shallow as well. So I don't think that there's a user conflict again. I'll go back to my field team and just you know double check. Um, I know that was probably on the checklist and where they got that okay. data, either anecdotally or from being out there or whatever the situation was. But we'll, okay. we'll make sure. I don't know if anyone wants to check in with the, some of the local baymen. Sure, we'll that would be great. See if they perceive any conflict with that area. I think that'd be a good idea. I, I don't know that to be a. I, th I think it's very muddy. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think it's I think it might be there. closed too. So. Okay, that might be the case too. <laughs> Right, well, then, Honestly, yeah, if we can help open bottom land by well, that's doing just this, it. All these things awesome. that we're doing are, you know, hopefully sure. helping on many levels. Well, that is inside Wood Tech Island, so that is probably closed. Well, it's seasonal, isn't it? It's seasonal. It's a seasonal opening, and that 
more of a plywood tick and everything. It, it opens up like December 15th. December, December to April or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so if you could get back to us with that information, yeah, then we'll definitely. do a little research as well. Okay. Yeah. It sounds really promising in the right location. Yeah, we're definitely excited about it, and I think, um, yeah, it was uh, time is of the essence as far as getting the gear out soon, so I'll definitely follow up and then even... Do you have a timeline for the project? July. Yeah, I mean, uh, kind of as soon as possible, it's getting in, they're getting all, you know, prepped. They've been, okay. again, working with natural resources. They were hoping to get stuff out, you know, pretty much as soon as possible. Okay. Well, I think we have a meeting on the 25th. Mm -hmm. So yes. okay. why don't we try, if you join us again. And Definitely, and I could potentially even have my colleague who's really leading the charge on the project too, who could answer, you know, some more of the technical questions in more detail as well. That would be great if, if that person's available. Sure. It might be helpful. Yeah. He's talking about up here, I think, right? I'm not sure how far back. It'll be up here, right? Yeah, so I, yeah, I don't it's think it's, it's... Is that permanently closed or is yeah. it feasible? work on this they ch they check them weekly yeah so we have um how big one, is the staff one staff member who's you know this is her kind of a uh, baby so she's going to be overseeing everything but again you know getting an intern or different volunteers you know to help as well but for the most part it's designed so she could be out here and managing it um, on a weekly basis and with help and the duration support. is from july through yeah, it's, it's, we want three months of data, so the sooner we get started, the better, because we're getting into the um, you know, warmer season months where we wanted to be able to start our measurements. But yeah, so three months, and then, yeah, they wouldn't be deployed on a long-term you know, basis. We would obviously take everything out. And they're basically you know, lobster cages. They're just you know, coated wire, so mm -hmm. it's you know, standard gear that would be in the water. Because they, they root deeply, is it very hard to remove them then? So the macroalgae it doesn't root, de it's not like eelgrass, it's not as beneficial for habitat, it, you know, in some waters it even um, is a problem. But um, yeah, for the most part, it's, it's clipped onto these frames, so it's not oh. even in the bottom. The only thing that's gonna be on the bottom is the cages themselves. So okay. we're not actually planting anything, it's just clipped onto all these different, you know, mesh panels within the trap, the cage itself. Okay. So Kim, you've done some preliminary uh, water testing is that, is that correct? Was it the upwelling testing that was done? Yeah, as far as some of the groundwater work as well, which, yeah, I think, yeah. Is that going to be part of your measurement process? Yeah. You have pre and post. Yep, testing. and yeah, it's more, you know, looking at significantly, you know, the, the data that we're excited about getting is that bioextraction data that will actually show doing biologic, you know, tissue samples, showing how much, of you know, the, nitrogen the grasses. is, yeah. yes, with, okay. you know, controls and everything. So, yeah, it's designed so we'll have a nice, robust yeah. report to uh, Are you going to quantify you know, how much nitrogen and phosphorus and stuff come Exactly, out? yeah. So we did something similar with our kelp feasibility study, and so we were able to send it to the lab. This is, like, very similar to the program we're doing in George Capon now, cutting the existing vegetation and removing it. Uh, the macroalgae is being the removed. Is that basically the same concept? Yeah, I, I mean, different species because it's a different. Um, yeah, well, I mean, for the last two years, we've taken, we've taken it out, measured it, analyzed okay. samples of it to see how much is nitrogen, how much is phosphorus. And, yeah, Dr. Gold has all those. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm not too familiar yeah. with this project, but yeah, along the same lines, yep. Yeah, it's the same. I mean, you grow plants to absorb nitrogen and remove them. Exactly, yep. <laughs> Just different plants. Yeah. Okay. Right. Everyone okay? Yep. Yes. All right. All right. Well, that's all I had. Thank you so Thanks. much for your Thanks, time. Thanks, Kim. I will Thank certainly, you. I'll follow up. I'll yeah, send we'll you to the, the next meeting, 25th. Okay. Please, please join us again. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Kim. Kevin? Thank you, Rick, uh, board, Kevin McAllister with Defend H2O. Um, some meetings ago, I addressed the board on sea level rise and ultimately changes to the shoreline, uh, shoreline migration. Uh, in particular, I guess the need to um, 
monitor public access, and I, I believe the board has embarked on that for trustee roads. Um, if that is the case, and I will I hear more on that, is, is am I correct in assuming that there's been uh, an inventory is underway? We have been performing site visits of trustee roads and performing a general inventory uh, in lieu of our hopes to start to do some more detailed research on properties. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, lessons learned from Southampton and I'm more intimate with uh, at least the board's uh, undertakings of recent, you know, there was a, a brouhaha with respect to uh, an agreement with an adjacent property owner to one of their access ways. Um, it, it's created quite a stir, but in the course of that conversation, and you know, this goes back to some time ago when I was urging that uh, the town board as well to take an inventory of um, town lands, uh, including when you get into the private subdivisions, uh, there's many easements that get down to the water's edge. And then of course, uh, at least with uh, the town board now with CPF acquisitions of waterfront properties with dwellings that are being removed, you know, I, I think it's incumbent that uh, there's a, a full inventory and to the extent that the trustees can maybe coordinate with town board through planning uh, to undergo that inventory, I think is critically important. Um, as I provided to the board the last time, and this is New York State's projections that were adopted uh, last year, um, we've seen uh, four inches over the last 40 years. Uh, that's pretty consistent. Uh, now we're looking at 16 to 30 inches. That's the medium to high range. Uh, the low range is uh, dismissed because it's uh, the status. Uh, ultimately, I'm, I'm trying to impress upon the board there's eminent changes to shoreline location coming. Um, you know, having public access, of course, is uh, you know the, uh, basically the foundation of what the trustees stand for. Um, you know, again, the you know the access areas, uh, whether it be private, town, or trustee, are very important. And then ultimately, I guess, with respect to further analysis, to really pay attention to the structures, and, and they are coming in everywhere, including East Stampton. Uh, I'm aware of this, and you know, I, I think, uh, to, and I don't use the term loosely, it's, it would be really important that the trustees um, you know, get ready to defend, because uh, you know, I have to imagine there's gonna be enormous push uh, from the private property interests to you know, fortify and, and really structure the shoreline in their interests. Uh, that you know potentially could impact again the public use. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. So I can sell it. Clams, I think. <laughs> nope. Not directly. <laughs> uh, trustees, thank you for uh, time tonight. I'm going to be mercifully quick. Um, I brought uh, a map. You've seen a similar map uh, previously. Um, the last point that uh, I, I didn't make last time I spoke with you was that the cumulative effect of laying the cables, the 138 kilovolt cables um, that uh, Deepwater Wind plan to lay together with the other lease areas by Bowen uh, will create uh, substantially more of a, an EMF than just the 90 megawatt wind farm we're talking about. Remember that 90 megawatts will produce only 34 megawatts uh, but if you add in all the other lease areas, you get a serious um, uh, increase in uh, electromagnetic field. Uh, my concern is that I think the best way to think of it, or the best way I think of it, is that you know, if you, you want, I'm sure you've all heard of invisible fences. Uh, you put a little electronic device around uh, your pet's neck, and as the 
pet gets close to the air, um, to the electric fence, it has a sound and then a, a, a subtle shock and the, the dog or cat knows not to go near the fence again. Um, my fear is that this, this laying of all these cables, this network, this um, offshore network of cabling, will create uh, for a lot of the bottom-dwelling fish an electromagnetic invisible fence. Uh, now, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't know whether this is the case or whether it's not going to be the case. Uh, from my reading, though, there is a risk. There's a substantial risk. Uh, and I believe that it's a risk that needs to be addressed and studied before proceeding with the um, laying of these, this network of cables. Uh, that's really I, I, all that I wanted to say. Um, apart from the fact that uh, given all the questions that are outstanding with um, regards to deep water wind, the price, the, the contracts, the details, you know, how many cables, the capacity of the cables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This, this, the more you look at it, the, the more that there is unknown. You know, I would request that the trustees simply not make a decision uh, until more information is forthcoming. If you make a decision without the adequate information to draw um, the conclusions that you need, uh, it would be premature and very dangerous. So that's my only request, is that you not make a decision until you have all the information at hand. Uh, uh, finally, I've, uh, just as a matter of record, um, I'm providing a copy of all my letters, uh, all 76 pages of them. I don't expect you to go through them all, but they'll be on the record. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sai. Sai, so, so is, is this map, um, did you insert this, the invisible fence yourself, or this is from Boehm? The lease areas are indicated here, but where did this actually come from? The, map. the map itself is mine. It's, uh, yours. it's based on the um, uh, Boehm leased areas. So right. it's. I've and then you overlaid. I've, just, I've laid them. Yes, overlaid them all. Uh, the uh, all the wind leases mm -hmm. are all superimposed on the same map. You okay. see, so you can just take them and, and lay okay. them over. So they are quite accurate. All right. Thank you. Thanks for all your work. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to new business. Front. Uh, under new business, if I had something that I wanted to share, you want to wait until the end of... Yeah, why don't we go through the agenda that'd be you fine. can add something. That's okay. Fine. And Rick. We'll, oh, I'll wait till we get to committee reports. Sorry, Sorry. Okay, so under new business, we have Akabonic Hog Creek, and we've received an application from Susan Brierley, Dewey's Planning, on behalf of the Marks, located at 85 Louse Point Road, Shoreline Stabilization. At this moment, I don't think um, we've had a, mo a chance to see this property yet, so I'd like okay. to table it. Um, Susan, do you agree? I agree. That's yeah, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It and just came in at the end of May. So. Oh, okay. And uh, I think Brian has an update for us on the kayak racks. Uh, All right. On Gerard Drive. <coughs> yeah. Um, Francis and Jimmy had asked if I would be kind enough to look into uh, locating a couple of uh, contractors to um, build uh, four racks. And uh, that being said, I, I did, and there's a bit of a disparity. The first gentleman uh, came in at... Uh, <clears throat> this is us buying the material, uh, so it's just the labor, um, it is 2600 And um, then I had another gentleman um, who uh, agreed to do it for $1,200. Um, that being said, um, I have the uh, proposal. They came in late. I have it on my email. Um, I would uh, you know, make a motion that... Um, we move on this. There's about a dozen kayaks just laying on the beach now. Both Francis and Jim, when I told them about Chris Hamilton's number for $1,200, they said, it, you know, present it to the board, and if everybody's in agreement, and I would make a motion 
that we accept this. Um, Except for two, Brian? No, for four. For four? Yeah. Yeah. Sold. Yeah. So I'll yeah. second that second motion. motion. All right, and I'll present that proposal to uh, those, uh, the paperwork to Arlene uh, tomorrow so we have it on record. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Aye. I'll uh, wrap thank that you. up with the contract. Thank the, you, Brian. You're Thanks. welcome. Brian. Okay, uh, under the Harbor Management Committee, John's been working on a proposal to get an EMF study uh, underway with the folks over at BOEM, which seems like a very relevant and important yes, topic. Indeed. John, can you share a little bit on that with us? Well, BOEM has announced their 2019 study idea projects and the a review of the effects of EMFs on migratory fish is number two on that priority list. Great. So assuming that gets funded, which considering the fact that it's the second priority is pretty likely, that study will begin in, I believe it's October of 2018 and expected to be wrapped up by the end of 2019. And my understanding of it is that it's basically a review of the literature, the known information on the effects of EMFs on migratory fish uh, that are commercially valuable in the Northeast, in our region, and uh, any known studies uh, that uh, you know, relate to the, uh, the effects of EMFs on those fish or, or related fish. Are there species of fish that we know the commercial fishermen would l like to have studied? So in other words, they're not just going to come up with, uh, they're not going to study the effects on certain fish and then we find out from the commercial fishermen that, they're not indigenous well, they're, what about them. these fish, the ones well, that we- I think we've already received some you know, negative feedback that- Well, that's why I'm asking. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and are these studies going to be on the on the the type of EMF transmission that that is potentially going to be put forth through these cables? This particular that are cable. In? That's my assumption. I mean, oh. there's re really just two types of cables, AC and DC. I think uh, I don't know much about EMFs, but I think it's EMFs or EMFs. I think DC cables put out more more emissions than AC cables. This particular cable is an AC cable. But I don't think that, you know, the, D, the emanations from a DC cable are any different than the EMF emanations it's from an just, AC it's cable. It's just more powerful. It's just more powerful. Yeah. John, speaking is, there, is there an opportunity for the trustees or members of our fishing community to contribute to the structure of the study or have you gotten any I don't know. I mean, what our request, the letter we wrote, asked that this be looked at and, you know, cited the commercial and recreational fishery along the beach here and suggested actually a, a field study. It requested a field study with, uh, using telemetry, which would, you know, more or less tag fish, find out where they go, and then you know, do a sort of a before and after. Mm -hmm. That would require a cable to be installed and activated, obviously, but it's really the only definitive way you would know anything about it, unless you used <coughs> you know, some other cable somewhere else that was already being installed. Right. But that's not here, and we were, you know, we've yeah, been told uh, many times by speakers that we want something that's relative to here. Site-specific, species-specific. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the request was basically for field studies. Mm -hmm. the, the, their assessment really fell on doing a literature review. They did say that, uh, you know, based on the results of the review, it could lead to recommendations for further field studies. And I know they are doing work with sturgeon in the New York bite, sturgeon or susceptible to electri electrical transmission, much like skates and rays and other crustaceans. Um, 
So it's being done in the area, and it is telemetry studies. So it may more, you know, move into telemetry studies on the effects of migratory fish. And I, you know, my feeling is given all the <laughs> projects planned for the New York bite down the coast, and the importance of migratory fish to commercial and recreational fisheries in the mid-Atlantic, that these kind of studies very well may, you know, develop. And this and may should be the develop. first step. Yeah. Yeah. I think we really need to be looking at these things. So it's great that you got it on the table. I think it would be really That's helpful terrific. to understand how much we can participate in the mm -hmm. study. And I think if there's mm -hmm. any way to reach out to someone there to see, you know, if we could get someone to come speak. out to meet with speak. us or meet with our <laughs> fishing community. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the, the fellow at Bowen that I, you know, dealt with earlier. He's been here. He's been to Montauk, I know. He's okay. So there's some familiarity with our region. Yeah, so he may be willing to. For people who are watching, and for myself as well, an AC cable and a DC cable. I understand, having, you know, continued to read as much as I can, that the fibro, fiber um, optic <coughs> cables that are used for telephone is quite different than the cable that we are oh, yeah. talking about. Communication cables. One is electric, and one is for telephones. Yeah, and there's they, no comparison. And a lot of people may be confused about yeah. the use of what kind of cable is being used. Until most recently, I didn't realize that myself, that one yeah. cable is vastly different well, than we, the other. We had somebody come in and show us a, a map of all these cables that are presently going through the ocean, and the majority of them are communication cables. Right, Some of the them are DC optic. cables, but none of them are AC cables. Right. So AC is the electric? AC and DC are both, DC are both yeah. different okay. types of electric. Right. Right. The okay. fiber optics are a different type of cable. It basically uses light. Okay. All right. So. Thank you. John, was there a direct response to your proposal, or was it more of Bohm, as a result, published this, and we're kind of assuming that it, our proposal was taken into account? Well, I called them up before our last meeting and um, asked them, you know, what if, if they've come to any conclusion on our request. And she directed me to this particular study. So I think, I mean, I'm not sure if we're the only people that requested something like this, but we did request it. She you know, gave me the impression that this was, you know, directly addressing our concerns, or you know, addressing our concerns, not necessarily directly, because like I said, it's not a field study; it's uh, you know, it's a literature review. Basically. Right. Okay. Thanks, John. Brian, did you have something else under new business? One other quick thing. Um, I got to thinking that it would be really helpful to the Town Marine Museum if we were to give them a um, three hundred dollar check to help them with their operating costs, the building. I know the town plays a part, but you know they ask very little in terms of their admissions. Uh, there's a lot of upkeep for the um, you know, uh, things that they display. Uh, and I think it would be a nice gesture. And uh, really, um, the museum itself, uh, in my opinion, uh, really defines um, what our history and the trustees um, are about. And they're neighbors of ours, and a lot of times they don't have people come, you know, and that's unfortunate. It's a beautiful museum. Yeah, um, maybe this a little bit of money would also help, uh, or we could ask that they earmark it to, um, you know, to advertise. Um, but um, there's a thought, I mean, you know, we don't have a lot of money, but you know I think something like this would be beneficial. And if you want time to think about it, we can talk. You know, talk about it uh, the next time we meet, or if you're inclined as I am, uh, we can vote now. I, I think that the uh, town basically covers the operating costs of the building. Right. So uh, you might want. I, I would think we might want to find out from the historical society. Mm -hmm what the needs of, what their needs may be, and maybe try to target the money somewhere that we feel is appropriate rather than just throw them $300 and, you know. Yeah. I mean, well, we might want to target it. Yeah, actually, I thought about that. 
Um, but now that I think about it a little more, I think, and I'm not implying that you're not saying this, um, you know, I, I think they run a very tight ship. Uh, my sense is that it's basically volunteers. Yeah. Um, and if they didn't need some monies, they wouldn't be asking for money. Um, and this is not a lot of money. This and is by request. Uh, no. No? No. And um, you know, I, I think they would be delighted. Um, and it would also be uh, kind of something special that we could do for them. Uh, and I think they would have no problem finding ways to uh, spend the money. I don't think the town meets all of their needs. That being said, um, I wouldn't be opposed to looking into it a little further. Uh, but my sense is that uh, um, they could certainly use uh, the little bit of help. Um, I think we should support the history of our community. I like the idea very much. Yeah. The yeah. trustees had their meetings down at building for years. Mm -hmm. and our office was I think it's a great idea. You know, just that Francis and Jim aren't here, and it's just maybe just in fairness to all the board members. Just well, that's why I brought it up tonight. <laughs> no, I'm I'm kidding. Uh, I'll research it a little more, and uh, we'll talk about it at, yeah, at our next meeting. I think, I think it's a very good, good neighborly idea. thing to do. Yeah, I like I that. Agree. Yeah. I agree. I think it's a great idea, Brian. And it's a, a, a okay, good great. heritage. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. revisit it with everyone the next time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'll have progress. a little more information then. Sounds good. Uh, Dell has a lot going on tonight. Uh, I think we have more horseshoe crab work going on. And uh, he, he asked if we could maybe cover beaches so he can multitask this mm -hmm. evening. Mm -hmm. so. Can I go with him? No, I'm, I'm the, uh, <laughs> my, going to. The horseshoe crab is, uh, can, uh, high tide for me at Promised Land is 8 o'clock, so I'd like to get over there between 8 and 8.30 and knock it out. Um, uh, so thanks, Rick, for letting me do the beaches. Uh, the the first issue is the ZBA public hearing notice application of the Lauder resident or Lauder issue at 118 Beach Lane. I guess they're requesting to uh, build a new residence in this spot. Now, from my understanding, I, I don't know much about this, but I know that we we've kind of been skipping over it because there hasn't been a full uh, committee beach committee here to um, discuss it together, and, and that's partially my fault because I haven't been able to go to the property. And because I knew that we're going here another night f in the same situation, I spoke with Jim a little bit this afternoon and, and got a real good detailed, um, all the information I, I needed to, at the very least, uh, I, I back his decision. I understand it. I wouldn't if I didn't understand it, but I do. The only thing I haven't done is seen it. Okay, well, it's, it got knocked down during sand. That's what I understand. And there's still a couple of cement blocks and stuff. The structure itself was there for quite a few years. It's right between Wainscott Pond and the mm -hmm. beach. Yeah. But and it's also in the floodplain of Wainscott Pond. Oh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. right, you know, like all the other houses down there right. on the beach. Okay. But it got knocked down and... Uh, um, What's the uh, conclusion? Well, well, I, I, I believe it's not in favor. Um, that that would be the the decision of of uh, the beach committee, um, and and we were, I was kind to on on the beach committee's behalf was going to recommend that maybe we should let the ZBA board know that that we weren't really in favor of this. I, I, I tend to agree with that. Okay. I think, I mean, we, the house we, was always yeah. getting damaged in storms, too, prior to then. Mm -hmm. So it's... Um, and Irene, I, be, I believe, had, had, a, had a good tight, right. dance with it as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, from, from again, I, I don't want to say too much because I, I didn't physically see it, but um, from from all my understandings, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to have to you know, side with Jimmy and, and John in this case. Um, do we need to take a vote to send a letter? Because Jim mentioned sending a letter to the ZBA like tomorrow because it's yeah. closing. Yeah. So I Probably. think we need to put it to a The vote. public comment period is closing soon. All right, I, I'd like to make a motion to, to get a letter then sent to the ZBA board if, if Chris, is that something can be done? 
sure. quickly yeah. for, for them? Has Jim second? got something prepared? If we have a second. I'm sorry? Does Jim have something prepared? I, I don't know. I, I don't. He said he'll have it together in time. Well, I'll second agree. the motion. Uh, Bill second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you. Uh, the trash cans on the village beaches. Um, boy, I, 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 I don't really know where to go on this, so what I'd like to do is table it. I had a really nice conversation um, with uh, uh, um, 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 Ed McDonald today, and it was not village related. It was me and Ed sitting down and talking about this issue as it in the past and how it stands now. And we did it at Main Beach this morning and, and the cans were lined up on the beach. Um, it, it, it really looked neat. Yeah. He assures me these guys, and I know these guys can do the job. Yeah. My, my beef was what happens at the end of the day till the next morning. That was has been my contention the whole time about this issue. Um, that's when I usually ran into the mess. Um, they understand that, or Ed did. Ed understood my point, but you know I was seeking a compromise. I actually have a a, a new thought process going on about this. Um, and I'd like to address it next time. Uh, it, it's, it's a different compromise. I think it's going to be better. And uh, uh, w w at the same time, what I'm trying to do is wear my carpenter's tools and try to mend the bridge that, that, that uh, you know, I may have been responsible in, in chipping away at, and I don't want to drag the problem, the trustees into this problem. I want to correct the problem. I want to get it behind us. And, and move on with a good relationship with uh, the, the village and the beach managers, yeah. the, and the new beach manager. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to doing that, and I'll get into that the next meeting. I'll have more of a, a proposal of what I have in mind, and hopefully the, the village can um, give me the opportunity to address them, address it to them, and may, maybe we, we can put this to rest. But me meanwhile, the cans look, didn't look really that bad. They look nice, they look neat. They I know these guys do a great job. Um, it's, and I, and I, as I told Ed today, it's never been the question of who's doing a good job, uh, the village doing a good job or a bad job. It was the irresponsible folks at night that were causing the mess that I had the issue with. It wasn't the guys not getting there early enough to clean it up. It was, the mess was there, and it was caused by uh, irresponsible folks. And uh, I, I, I don't want the blame to go any farther than that. And that's that. Okay. Uh, the third issue is the Adopt a Beach program. I, I believe we're all set with it, if, if we can. Didn't, wasn't that in the, in the paper? Notice adopt the a beach? Yeah. I really didn't notice. There's something in the paper, Adopt a Beach. I think, I thought, I thought we were just flyer? going to, uh, we were all gonna look it over. I just finished it last right. meeting. Right. We were all, it was, it was kind of late. I got it that day to everybody, I believe. Okay. So if everybody's had a chance to look it over and everybody's fine with it, I'd like to make a motion to put it into to action. Um, and again, I just want to make note that this is this was put together by Tyler Armstrong, mm -hmm. and uh, I want him to have the credit. Uh, I just kind of, I kind of changed it a little. Not didn't change it a lot at all. I, I basically just changed the uh, uh, the amount of times that we're going to require um, the, the uh, cleanups to be, and of course we uh, took took some things out of there that I didn't think were necessary, but you all know what they were and, and we were all in agreement, I think. And I think it's ready to roll. I'd, I'd like to see it see it in, in operation. I don't know how many people we have knocking at our door to get involved, but I think we'll have more once, once, it's, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. once it's got wheels. I'll, it's I'll second that. I think it's a good start. We can make adjustments as we yeah. see need fit. 
time, but I think we should get going on it. So cool. second. Almost here. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Awesome. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Tyler. Tyler. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tyler. And, and with that, I, I would like to say good night to you all. And uh, I hope Go you have a good rest of your meeting, and we'll see you in the water. Happy yeah. horseshoe crab. We'll get the new horseshoe crab. <laughs> All right, we'll see you. We'll get home Our horseshoe crab is, yeah. I think it's working out nice. <laughs> oh, it's going, the whole thing is going great as far as when that comes out, the whole thing's going great. And John's got some really good maps to talk about. So thanks, John. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Uh, is everyone okay if we do uh, Nappy Glazy Point? We have sure. a member of the community here, so we can... Let them get home at a reasonable hour this evening. Mm -hmm. um, we have the uh, application of the Victor D'Amico Institute Art at 110 Napigue Harbor Road, reconstruction of the existing bulkhead, and to raise the height 18 inches. Do we have anyone who's prepared to speak to that this evening? Which is this, the, what property is it, I'm sorry? It's the Art Barge. Or the Art Barge. On yeah. Pete Harbor. Um, uh, Jim Grimes was calling the, uh, uh, around the committee and uh, speaking today, but uh, no one's really had a chance to look at it, I don't think, uh, this, carefully. Yeah, uh, thanks, Arlene. Uh, let me explain how that works, as well as uh, Georgia Capon. Rather than us going down there separately, what we try to do is go together collectively. And I know that Jim, uh, uh, maybe as early as tomorrow, certainly this week, we'll be down there together to look at it. Uh, it just seems to work out better that way. Okay. Um, so uh, we will put that off until- we'll table that until the 25th. That you know what, fine. are they in for other permits? I assume they are. You wanna look at this? Not really. <laughs> okay. No, it's just, I think it was just the bulkhead because they were it's, concerned there's a, there's about. There's a bulkhead right now. It's six on the beach side. It's like six it. foot tall, seven foot tall. On the back side, I guess it was going to be backfilled with sand. They want to make it like 18 inches tall. So it's going to be like a 10 foot wall on the beach. We can have a combination um, bulkhead and handboard, and hand what's the wall stand or something. <laughs> what's the reason for making it? Well, I guess this, the, they needed that is height it, probably I mean, to stop necessary? at high water. Yeah, probably when it gets flooded in there, it's probably the, you know, the mark they're looking at. There's you some pictures a, in the back. Do you have there. a copy of the package, Susan? Yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah, the bulkhead does look pretty high already, so I don't know what the justification is. Yeah, I mean, the water really Looks comes like up that high? First coast is the It gets really flooded in there when it gets a you know, good storm. Northeast wind mm -hmm. pushing out. Yeah. Well, it is a barge that just got beached. Beached. So <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, it's right yeah. at yeah, the sensitive water's edge. Yeah. It. And we, we could ask Billy Mack to come in and give yeah. us an update. They probably also want to justify this since they're, since they're um, replacing a bulkhead, they might as well take um, anticipated sea, sea level rises. Well, that's rise what I was wondering. Is it, do they need it now, or are they just looking ahead? Well, take, I can see the, the, some pictures back there. Yeah, so. <coughs> well, again, you know, being on the committee, uh, I'll be talking to Jim tomorrow, and um, we'll contact the agent and do a site visit. Um, so Sounds good. That's, that's what I propose. Okay. Great. So we'll revisit this on the 25th. Mm-hmm. And we'll have more information for you. Great. Okay. And then we have an item that rolled over from the last meeting. We didn't have a quorum uh, after Jim left for an ambulance call. A uh, request from Susan Stadler to release uh, the house located at 191 Shore Road, lot 29S, to the same tenant, uh, Sabine Tulp. Tenant's affidavit of domicile has been received. And the uh, payment of 4% uh, of the yearly rent been payable to the trustees. And this is actually my wife's application, so I am going to recuse myself from the vote. Um, but it looks like it's pretty straightforward renewal from last year. Uh, Brian, you're on the committee. Do, do you want right. to comment? Uh, we have the letter sent to the trustee board. We have the check and the affidavit of domicile. Right. I had an oppor opportunity to look at it. Everything seems to be in order. And that being said, I would make a motion that we accept it. I'll second, second that motion. Okay, all in favor? Aye. <laughs> Aye. Okay, good. Testing guide. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Uh,
Bonacog Creek Harbor application at 155 Isle of Wright Road for Pragmite control. Uh, yeah, this is something we had previously, Susan and I had previously gone and looked at with the other um, neighboring properties um, that had already, you've already approved their permits. Um, I have no problem. Um, I would like to make a motion to, that we accept the application. And Mr. Horwith was kind enough to furnish us with the contractor information, which sure. I had requested. Um, my little sticking point on these permits. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I would like to make a motion. And I will and second that. We will. Uh, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. Uh, moving on to aquaculture, we have the Akabonic Harbor Mosquito Larvae Survey. Uh, John, do you have an update on that one? Yeah, we went out this today, most of the day, and uh, sort of did a training with the Nature Conservancy and Vector Control. All the samplers that we authorized uh, showed up, and um, myself and uh, Mike from planning uh, were there, so we were sort of the given, you know, training and identification of the larvae, the different stages. And um, we went out on the marsh in a few places to sort of be shown what kind of what we're looking for, the low spots where water collects and are likely to, uh, to have larvae in them. And then we'll be transmitting that data to the Nature Conservancy, who will then transmit it to Vector Control, and they'll be able to then identify hot spots of mosquito breeding, and possibly in, in, possibly in real time, meaning week to week, adjust their spray schedules to avoid spraying areas that aren't necessarily hot spots of breeding. But also in the long run, when they get the whole data set from the summer's sampling, we might be able to adjust next year's spray schedule uh, again to avoid or not necessarily spray certain areas that have consistently shown a lack of breeding activity. So then we spend a lot of time looking for access points and uh, we'll begin our first sampling day next Monday or Tuesday, depending on what vector control says. Susan and Mike and myself will be getting together later this week. We'll, we'll be the group leaders on the marsh to sort of make a plan of how we plan to attack the, you know, the, the sampling. There'll be three groups. And it's, you know, it's a matter of how we're going to proceed through the marsh. Because we can't, we can't just walk through the whole marsh. We're going to have to move to different access points. And whether we leapfrog ahead of one another or whether we uh, sort of just take, you know, a third of the marsh per group, we're, we're going to try to figure out what the best way to proceed is. No, you saw all the access points, right? Yeah, we've got several access, potential Are you access gonna need points. to do any temporary bridge building or anything like that? No, not, well, we're not sure about that until we actually get out on the marsh and start seeing where we can go and where we get stopped. I did it last year when we were around. Yeah, there's a couple spots you wanna yeah, we're on, make we're, provision for we're getting We're not in. looking forward to carrying planks. No, we were telling <laughs> you, you put them, we'll leave them out here. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, well, we'll have to figure that out when we get out there and see where we're going. And Nicole Mayer from the Nature Conservancy, who's sort of their chief marsh scientist, for lack of a more official term, uh, has agreed to come and give us a brief presentation on the program and how this is being enacted in other places. So, When is she going to do that, next Monday or Tuesday? Well, she was possibly going to come tonight, but she couldn't. And I'm going to send her a, you know, and schedule, and she'll pick a, a time that she. The instructions are that Friday they will notify us from the Nature Conservancy, 
as to whether or not Monday would be the day that we're to go out, right? And everybody showed up, and I want to thank public record here, everyone who applied and who was interested in becoming a, a, a now a compensated uh, um, volunteer sampler. sampler, water sampler. I want to thank everybody who's watching this evening for um, signing up because it was really a three-month project to get people interested in it, number one, and number two, to actually have people who were making themselves available for the 10-week program. And it's 7 o'clock in the morning. So um, I'm looking forward to that <laughs> 7 o'clock um, adventure. But I want to thank John very much and uh, everybody who's worked on this thus far because it's really important. And I'm hoping that in the end we will uh, come to a point where we can um, eliminate methoprene. That would be our you know, goal. So I'm excited to be a participant in this. And uh, Kevin's here in our audience, and I want to thank you for signing up. Face. Yeah, <laughs> hanging on every word. I see. Yes, good, no, good. But, you know, it's it's a step in the right direction, and I'm yeah. really excited about it. Also, the salt marsh um, reconstruction to um, help the salt marsh so that we can eliminate the mosquito nesting in its entirety. It's a great learning process, and thanks to everybody at Nature Conservancy and Suffolk County Vector for uh, getting involved. Yeah, I have a quick question, though, because I have lived with this whole thing for a number of years now. The All of this good work is taking place, and it is good work. What do we know about the pilot? I mean, does he truly know that he's not supposed to spray these areas? I mean, where's the oversight? You know, is he a well, county employee? They're, they're, they're laid out in, in these polygons. Right. So the pilot, as this is my understanding, mm -hmm. is given instructions as to what polygons or sections of polygons to spray and what he doesn't have to spray. Okay. So. And each week it changes. I'm assuming they have, you know, all GPS coordination, mm -hmm. and it's probably pretty specific. It, you know, they vector control was telling us today that you know they're kind of excited about this program, in part because uh, their co the costs of helicopter time and the materials, the the insecticide is very high, mm -hmm. so. The Somewhere in the more targeted they can, per spray. they can so stop using it all together and they'll save an enormous amount of money. <laughs> yeah, well, they get pushed back on from both sides. Sure. Which is a health issue. And yeah. Yeah. Good work. Thank so you. They're trying to, like, you know, satisfy people who are trying to, you know, minimize the spraying and people who are calling them up to Complain spray about their barbecue. I, I had one other thing about mosquitoes. Can you explain briefly what those mosquito are those mosquito ditches that we see in the marshlands? Yeah, that's that, where they hibernate. That's where they. That go. was all done. I never didn't know this. That was all done uh, by the Works Project Administration. So all in two years, I think, 1934 and 35. So they haven't really filled in. No, but some of them have. They, I mean, they oh, maintain they have, yeah. them to a degree. They and what was, but they're and what perfect was their, nesting points. But what was their function? Function was well. To, the the this mosquito we're dealing with the salt marsh mosquito won't breed in in pure salt water it it breeds in sort of brackish water so i think the idea was bring salt water into the marsh through the ditches and that'll help eliminate the breeding areas by increasing the salinity yeah it, it also it's been shown not drainage. to be the best way of doing it there are better ways of doing it. In Wertheim Preserve up in Shirley, they did a demonstration project and it's a, it's a national, you know, wildlife preserve with a lot of marshland there. And they did some reconstruction of the marsh where they built some ponds and smaller, they call them runnels. So it's kind of a, it's a miniature ditch in a way. And to drain those ponds, so the the salt water will come into the pond. Fish are then uh, able to breed and live in the pond. And the fish are really your best first defense against mosquito breeding mm -hmm. and mosquito larvae. They eat eat the larvae. So they found that that's more effective. A more na effective natural way of controlling mosquito breeding than ditches are. Sure. So. 
So the part of this project also is to identify some areas that may lend themselves to these runnels to drain the standing water out into, say, a ditch or into the harbor itself, and then prevent it or, or you know make it so that it won't collect water and be a breeding spa spot. So um, you know that's part of the pro program. Every every site you sample, will, a picture will be taken. So, you know, when this is all analyzed, you know, certain areas can be looked at for the possibility of doing some, you know, small scale hand work to try to improve them through, dra you know, improved drainage. And then one last thing. Last year I saw a gentleman during mosquito activity time from the county, uh, he had like a cone shape and he was doing, he told me he was doing individual hot spots. He was running around giving yeah, no. that area uh, a shot, if you would. Oh, they do hand work, yeah. They have backpacks where they'll go and okay. spray by hand, yeah. actually. If they know there's a spot and they don't want to just broadcast the spray everywhere, hmm. they'll do that. Yeah, that would seem to be a little more efficient yeah. and yeah, they, less intrusive on the environment. If they you seem to have a fairly more. efficient program. Yeah. Yeah, so I think they, there have to be specific they get specific qualities hot spots of an area stuff. to be able to do that, that yeah. hand work. The people that we had last year were very familiar with the area. They were good. And, you know, they're trying, but it comes down to a question of whether this is worth doing or not, you know, whether it's better off just to, to leave it alone. Part of the problem with vector control, uh, as I understand from talking to these guys today, is that you know they have limited manpower. So they have guys that go out on the marsh every week, just like we'll be doing. But they're accessing. You know, we'll we'll be doing maybe 200, three, 400 samples in a day with our three crews. I don't know how many, but something in the hundreds. They'll just go out and do a few. So they'll base their spray schedule on you know what sampling they can do and because of their limited manpower they can't identify areas that really don't need to be done and don't need to be done with great specificity right so they probably over spray to a degree because they just don't know, you know that's why this is an imperative program yeah. that we're doing getting some field data Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Okay, thank you for the update. Thank you, John, very yeah, much. Thank you. Okay, so we'll, we'll move along to education yep. and the Ryson Fund Scholarship <coughs> update. Ryan? Well, you know, I had so much fun uh, nice. on the 31st, uh, which was a Thursday. I went to the East Hampton High School and participated in their local scholarship, and I was amazed at the number of uh, businesses and the fire departments and the trustees and the list just goes on and on that gave um, uh, monies towards these kids to help them uh, as they get ready to go off to college. Um, I also took the opportunity to, um, I, might, I might just mention that it was really well attended too. Uh, there were a lot of uh, you know, family and members and friends. But so I took a moment to explain um, to the uh, seniors what the Rysom um, scholarship was about. And then and it was kind of apropos because <clears throat> Captain Rysom, William Rysom, in the late 1700s, he came to East Hampton with his six girls, which he enrolled in Clinton Academy. And when he passed away, he left a fairly large sum of money, uh, especially you know back in that day, that we established the trustees and continued to provide money uh, in way of a scholarship. So um, it was uh, a really, really nice time, and I'm so glad and so proud that we had an opportunity to present not only a certificate, um, did the young lady come down and get her money? Well, maybe she didn't need it. <laughs> uh, but we told her to do so, yeah. so I'm sure she will. We'll follow up on that. Okay, so thank you. Did, did, did we announce her name here? 
Yeah, um, we did not. Be, so we should we? Your lesson. Hannah Moran, you guys remember? I didn't make it, I'm sorry. That's all right. So uh, Hannah, Hannah knows who she is. Hi, Great Hannah. job. <laughs> Yes, congratulations. I, 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 was, I want to say Moran, but that, I could be wrong. I wanted to yeah. attend, but I wasn't. I was away, so I would have been there because oh, I yeah. think it was, it a, was wonderful a lot of thing. fun. Yeah, that's and, uh, great. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Hannah, that's and all the uh, all the people who uh, submitted their applications. Yeah. Yes. A lot of good work. Okay. Um, next on the committee reports, we have Georgia Capon. And we have an application from a Floken, Joseph Floken at 17 Georgia Association, uh, bulkhead and dock repair. Brian, is that something that you're up to speed on? Is that something we need um, to Okay. This is Lima Harbor? This is on Georgia. 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 I'm sorry. All right, this is something that both uh, Jim and I are working together with. Um, and um, I'll have to check with Jim. Uh, I'll be calling him tomorrow on a couple of other uh, uh, issues, and um, we'll have an answer for you at the next meeting. Okay, so we're going to table to the 27th. Yeah, table it, please. We'll do. Yeah. Let me, let me just say one quick thing. Going to these site visits with Jim, Jim Grimes is like going on a field trip. I, was, I knew you were going to say that. No, he, he really no, he is, right? He knows his stuff. <laughs> He knows yeah. his plants, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll take this opportunity because I don't want to embarrass him. So Jim, <laughs> in, in many of these cases, you know, truly is the lead guy. You know, I'm holding his briefcase. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm learning a lot. Um, so I defer to Jim. He calls me, he says, Brian, we're going to, you know, on this day, we're going to visit this person, this person. Does it work for you? Yes, I'll meet you there. And, um, yeah. Very good. So, oh, he's very knowledgeable. Yes, he is. Very knowledgeable. Yeah. So we'll look forward to hearing from you guys on the 25th. Okay. All right, so back to harbor management, and uh, we have our horseshoe ongoing crab. horseshoe crab survey. <laughs> yes, well, one of our people just left. I will say that I did the, um, the PEG stretch with Jim Grimes uh, last week, the week, week before. Two weeks. Two weeks already? My goodness. Okay, and with uh, Dell, and Dell has gone now to do the, this evening. Um, and that was quite amazing that night. Um, I have to say the amount of horseshoe crabs we saw um, spawning was just unbelievable. And at the last moment, the full moon did come out. So this evening, I will be North Harbor, uh, Northwest Harbor. And um, Mr. Aldrin, you'll be joining me, yes? Yes. In the dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, it's it still be light. been quite an, um, an interesting learning experience for me, actually getting to the tagging point and, um, you know, I think we tagged 15 at the peak that evening. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll see it. We don't have the equipment this evening to do the tag. No, I think we're just going to do counts. Just the counting. Northwest. But yeah. um, it's... We uh, got some interesting, you know, differentiation between the uh, county park part of Northwest and uh, Mile Hill Road part of Northwest also. So mm -hmm. hopefully we'll be able to get some more information about that through these cycles. We got an email from Matt Scalfani today, and it seems I guess we're about halfway through the cycle of looking at these things. So it'll be, I guess, another full moon after this new moon, another full moon, and, mm -hmm. and then not we're sure how far we go beyond that. I think it's just through June, end of June, no? Not sure, I'm not sure. Mm, okay. But it's the first time um, that we're doing as, as an intensive. I don't think that it's been done before, but then someone said that they had been involved in it previously, so. Yeah. Um, there have been uh, participants in this study before in East Hampton. I don't know if it was as well structured Formalized, or represented yeah. as this is. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of promise to continue this program yeah. going forward. I think forward. this might be something that trustees want to build on and Absolutely. formalize a little bit more. You know, this we're doing more now than has been done in the past, but I think we can do more yeah. in the future with more sites and Absolutely. You know, get some interested people involved and kind of act as the clearinghouse for you know, what's going on with ocean crabs. Or the, the high school, um, uh, Aubrey Peterson has reached out and he actually has started to take his, uh, some of his students out who want to do this without direct 
um, connection to this program because yeah. of the youth and so forth. But uh, your neighbor, um, there uh -huh. are some people, Tom, Tom DeVries, if you're yeah. watching this evening, come and join us. But there are people who are interested. Hopefully we can get um, a period of time then if we see that they're nesting. I mean, that's, I believe, the goal that we can perhaps um, ask that people not drive in the areas of nesting for that limited period because so many people have written or written to me on my social media pages that there used to be hundreds of these um, horseshoe crabs on the beach and now there are so few. So if we could protect the, the nesting um, horseshoe crab um, areas, we would see more of them. So that's, I think, the goal here as well. Okay, very good. We'll keep us posted on the progress. And you have the, the new moon study this week and then the full moon study towards the yes. end of the month. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. Okay, uh, moving on to roads. Uh, we've been looking at trusty roads, and I think we have an issue over on Merchant's Path. Susan, can you bring us up to speed yeah, on that, please? Yeah, the three of us, with <coughs> myself and Dell, took a walk over there last week. Um, we had been asked, um, there was some concerns with the fire department and access for emergency vehicles up there when emergencies arise. Um, we did view um, some properties which have uh, sp split rail fencing um, erected right on the roadway within a foot of the dirt part of the graded path, road, road bank. The graded part. Um, some further investigation, um, I found a, a, um, a couple of the properties that we looked at um, actually have on their surveys a scenic easement. So when I looked further with the planning department, there are actually um, some policy written in their easement that no building fences or other structures can be constructed, erected, maintained on that scenic easement, mm -hmm. which clearly is in a violation of, I guess, that town code. Um, we also observed some, some landscaping, plantings, grass irrigation, also in this scenic easement area. So maybe that's something um, I can forward that information to you, Chris. Yes. You can write your letters. Let's do it. We can make them aware please, uh, of please that. Please give me your notes and everything so I can figure out exactly where it is and figure out what yeah, the problems have, they are. Yeah, I have all the information Great. from the building department, the surveys, the planning department's um, determination okay. for the is that, easements. And is that something and all that. you're envisioning we do? Uh, we communicate directly with the property owner or communicate through code enforcement? Well, I, maybe we should do both, you know? Make them aware mm -hmm. of the situation. Yeah, if I that would be in there. That seemed to be pretty helpful in the last uh, issue yeah. we had, so I don't see any reason why we can't do both, go both routes. Right. Yeah, because I think the highway department may also get involved to do some additional grading to possibly widen the road a right. little bit. Since the mm -hmm. emergency vehicles from the Sag Harbor Fire Department we're having access right. issues mm -hmm. due to how constrained the road that is now with the fencing, as Susan pointed mm -hmm. out, being so tight. It's there's right. no shoulder yeah. whatsoever. And if they can't get in there, they're not responsible if it's yeah, a private road. Through, so so there are, safety, there are real yeah. safety issues yeah. on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a couple other properties that I have to go back to the planning department but we can't and, and get necessarily more information force on. something if in it's a it's scenic easement on private property. No. That would yeah. be a code enforcement. It would be code enforcement. It, well, that would be code enforcement. There's a very high probability it's also trustee property as well. We haven't so certified we have that yet. Again, if we get our property surveyed, we'll. I was just going to say, is this a precursor we'll know to a exactly survey? what we're possibly. talking about? We but have a width, it's, it's pretty clear. It's quite possible. It's pretty clear. On, on a lot of the surveys, three rod, it's well within. The I mean, once you start three planting nine. landscaping, yes, roads are three rods wide. Yeah, what's a rod? Yeah, forty. Nine. Nine. It's, <laughs> it's thirty. It's four. That would three rods would be forty nine and a half feet, I believe. The same width That's as the beach That's, That's quite wide, actually. Yeah. Do, are are so these people planting? The that, are the homeowners planting now. landscaping on landscape. the trustee road, and in the hope that it will become eminent domain? 
You should drive the trustee truck down. <laughs> we're, we're not we're not sure, but <laughs> I, I think it's more convenient or and just they view, just view don't enhancement, know. We privacy can't enhancement. Say that. But so it kills me too that like going back and somebody's survey, fair, helpful, wouldn't uh, wouldn't, wouldn't their survey safe. indicate that there's a trustee road there? Yeah, well, there. that's the thing. Yeah. Some of these surveys that I'm looking at, there's it doesn't no. even it doesn't even define that it's a trustee road. It d defines it as a dirt road. Ah, very good. So our work when we've been going out cataloging the roads and researching, we're compiling all this information and our plan is to yeah. prioritize these properties and then make a recommendation to the board to begin possibly a, a surveying process where mm -hmm. we would do a few properties a year okay. so that is, it's cost effective and Is there know, an managed. order in which you are selecting properties or they just happen to come up, someone says We we had a theoretical order but when priorities like safety for the fire department come up yeah we kind of so the fire ahead. department notified the yes, trustees that's correct oh, interesting so that became yeah. a priority for okay, us good or okay. if the public contacts us for some yeah. reason yeah. we have our we have our map and we have our ideas of where we want to look at but yeah when something like this came up we went right it reminds me i have to get my framed yeah. map that you gave us <clears throat> at the framers i had it framed <laughs> Why? <laughs> because it shows where all the properties are. I thought it was a, a well, wonderful. It's yeah. not. You it's know, not concise. It's not but it's general. Okay, we're working on that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Good, all right, job, good work. Thank you. Is there anything else on roads you want to bring up tonight, or is that our main? I'd like to chime in on roads before we move on, if that's okay. Um, sure. Didn't sure. miss an opportunity to speak. I think a little earlier about the Art Barge Road that came up at the last meeting yes. with the chain Did over you? the uh, mm -hmm. public access possibly New York State Road and property. Spoke to Chris Cohan of the Art Barge today. Um, seemed to be pretty willing to cooperate. Um, he did say that the chain is now down, so he doesn't have it up. Um, but he also seemed to have a different interpretation of uh, what that chain was blocking off. Um, his opinion was a little more that the chain did, never did and is not blocking off um, New York State Road or property, and I just haven't seen it, so I don't know, and I'm sure you do more than I. But Either way, he uh, wants us to go down there and meet with him, with me, possibly his attorney, uh, and several whatever trustees want to go down there and sort of get a lay of the land and speak about the issue in person. Um, he was very cooperative. He wasn't being combative, but he did have a different interpretation, and he seems that to think that uh, public access through that dirt road to New York State property has never been blocked off by that chain. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Yeah, I, well, I took a lot of pictures of this. Okay. He, you know, he was very agreeable, and he stated that it, he had put the chain up with the signage initially because of the, um, the bulkhead being in such disrepair. They were afraid somebody was going to go down there and hurt themselves, and that they were having problems with vandalism at the Art Barge, hmm. which in my opinion, is not reason to cut off of public access. Right. Um, and I relayed that to him. Um, he felt that, you know, those locals that do use that beach um, and, and that waterway know that they can take the chain down and go through it was his understanding. Um, I don't know how true that is. Okay. Because when you drive up, I mean, you know, just come off Napig Meadow and, you know, a couple hundred feet in on that dirt roadway to those two properties and the Napig, there's a chain with signs, you know, <coughs> private, you know, private property, no trespass. Exactly. As, a, as just a normal resident, if you were to see that sign, you would think you're not permitted on this right. property. And, it's personal, and anybody, private anybody, property. Right, and anybody from the public should have access to that, not just, you know, the local laymen that know that they can go down there and Right. Is he, and is he that saying that that chain is on their property? No, that chain on is property. on state property. And they have a granted access right. down that dirt roadway to, there, there's the art barge and then there's a private residence right. down there. And then just before the art barge, there's a sand road that goes down to the beach, right? Mm -hmm. and He's saying to me that that road is, no, is not blocked off by the chain. But That's not, but the initial, well, right, when you come right off the of Napeague Meadow and, and then right before the towers, the towers are right here to the right. left, and there's a little dirt road that goes out to those. 
so, so is there public road. access down the Thing. public road around that the chain? That chain is right, right there. And that's well before that road. Well yeah. before, yeah. Well, we tentatively pointed out um, Wednesday afternoon, if that works for anybody that wants to be involved. If not, we can definitely change it in <coughs> a different day. But on our schedules, we looked at uh, Wednesday afternoon seemed to work. Of course, we can, uh, like, 4, sometime around 4. I can't do it. Okay. Wednesday. I would love to go. I could do Just Thursday. Learn, okay. But um, Wednesday is not good. I could All do right. Thursday or Friday. Okay. So, uh, well, there's somebody on the roads committee should probably be, yeah. be there. Del yeah, or Susan like, should, I think Susan would Susan like to be there. Be She's there. done yeah. a lot of research yeah. on it, so yeah. I would, I would ask that Susan be involved. Did you take a look at those deeds that I, did you get a chance to take a look at I those deeds? I did not. Okay. Nope. Right, we'll take a look, yeah, take a look before we go down there. Because okay. his, like you said, his interpretation of the wording of that deed, I think is, is a little different than I may different possibly than, ours, yeah. Than ours. <laughs> yeah, agreed. If, if um, Susan and Chris, I would love to go just to learn. So Thursday or Friday works for me, Wednesday afternoon, no. Okay. And Again, that was just a tentative uh, first look date, so we'll look at Thursday and Friday of next week. Good. Of this week? This week? No. Oh. oh. Next week. Well, the following week. This week we both yeah, okay. jammed we'll up already, yeah. so we're looking That's at fine. next okay. week. Okay. Oh, so yeah. you wanted Wednesday of next week? Yeah, just. I don't really want any of them. Just no, I, kind of I cannot do any Wednesday. No, week. no, today's Monday. We're kind of already looking into next week as this week being pretty difficult for us. Okay, well, next week I can do. Okay. Um, hold on. Oh, here I am. Next Wednesday I can definitely do. Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday yeah. Next, yeah. Next week, anyway, any day I could do. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's How about Susan McGraw Keeper? No Wednesdays for me no at all. Wednesdays. No, I volunteer okay. at LVIS. So, Susan, what can you do next Thursday or Friday as well? Yes. Okay. So we'll stick with the next Thursday, Friday. Thank you. Or, I'll, of course, I'll I'm not on the committee, so if it doesn't work for me, that's fine. <laughs> I just, you know, here, I'm going to just pass this around. Susan, would you just check these pictures and see if this is what you... Yes. Uh, that, that, yes, those are the pictures that I showed at our meeting. Okay. Okay. We so go. I did go down the right road. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, anything, anything else on roads before we move on? Chris, are you good? Good. Okay, Three Mile Harbor. Okay. Uh, we have the Harbor Lands LLC request to close out trustee permit T number 3-17, bulkhead replacement. Okay, this um, project is done and uh, at uh, Harbor Marina, correct? No. Is that Harbor Lands? Is that Gardner's? Gardner's Marina. That's Gardner's. No, oh, I'm sorry. Gardner's is the marina across from Three Mile Harbor. Yeah, marina. I got them confused. By the town dock. Right. So they went ahead and replaced the bulkhead, um, and um, I would say that um, this was done, you know, according to the information they gave us, um, but it was not done. Uh, in kind because they put the vinyl sheathing in. Right. Okay, that being said, uh, everything else was, was done correctly, as was the sheathing. So uh, we were waiting on a um, as-built survey. Yeah, we got it. Which we got. Um, and John, did you have an opportunity as well to go down there and look at it? I didn't, I took your word. For oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I believe that work was done by um, I'm not uh, sure who did it. Terry, I want to say. I'm not sure who did anyway, it. Anyway, they, they really did a super job, you know. Um, and uh, one of the things I liked about when they were doing the job is they put that. Uh, what do they call that, Bill, when they, uh, it's like almost like a sock to keep any. Oh, they built the claw? Yeah, yeah, they had uh, all that. Uh, Material uh, floating to keep any of the construction uh, debris well, entering the harbor. A boom, the boom. A boom yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that being said, um, you know, it looks like it really came out nice, and uh, the only difference is, of course, you know, it, it now has vinyl sheathing. Right. And um, I would, you know, make a motion that, um, you know, we uh, close out the application. Right. I'll second that. All in favor? Hi. Hi. So I think okay. I think they need a letter to yeah, give to we'll the take care of that tomorrow. building department. Okay. 
Okay, next is LWJ LLC, State of Duke at 178 Springy Banks Road, dock repair. Right. John? We talked about this last week. Um, it, uh, there's still some outstanding questions, particularly on the details of what realign the pilings means. That's, that's one of the work, work descriptions. And I actually looked at this a little bit closer from the water last week, and there's some pilings at the end that are broken and cracked and look like they need to be replaced. I spoke to the office before the last meeting, and they were going to, they didn't, the woman I spoke to didn't really know the details. She was going to talk to the people who did the work, were doing the work, and get it back to me uh, as to uh, you know more detailed description of the realignment, but I never heard from her, haven't heard from her since the last meeting, so. Um, Is that the agent I, of the applicant you're speaking to? I spoke, yeah, uh, I, I spoke to, yeah, Grimes, Keith Grimes' yes, Grimes. office. Oh, you're speaking Grimes to the contractor directly? Contract. Yeah. Okay. They filed the uh, application. I see. Okay. So I don't know. Um, they also have other permits they have to get. Um, I don't think this is going to be quickly. on our agenda uh, for a little while. I okay. think we might okay. also want to wait for the other results of the other permits to see what other conditions they may put on this work. So we're going to table this. You're going to keep an eye on it, and yeah, a I'll give her. I'll give her a call again, a reminder that you know, just find out what, where they're at, and that we need more information. She can get it to us whenever she's ready. Great. Okay, John. Thank you. Anything else on three mile? That's it. Yeah. All right. Administrative. Um, we have payment of the bills. We have Mike DeSuno and Sons, $800, opening of the Georgica Cut. Optimum, $167.61. Riverhead Building Supply, $13.88. North Fork Water Supply Company, $46.44. Star Island Yacht Club, $129.05. Pump Out Boat. Seacoast Enterprises, $70.28. Pump Out Boat. I would make a motion that we accept the uh, payment of the bills. Uh, second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will say that I'm, I'm on the water in Montauk Harbor a lot, and I've had the opportunity to see the, the pump out boat in action, and the guy seems to be doing a really good job. Uh, I see him cleaning, spraying down the boat all the time. I've seen him out and about cruising around, so I don't know which guy it is or what his name is, but it seems to be Sit going by. well. We could give him a shout out. Yeah. <laughs> so, nice job. Yeah, good thank you. Us. Okay. Maybe I'll snap some pics of them in action next time. Yeah, the three mile boat is also out and about. <laughs> Lani, so. Lani Rost, okay. Yeah. Is that something that we can ever do any PR on? Like advertise that they're out there so when they first more people are aware of yeah, it? Yeah, when they first started doing it, we had signs all over, you know, all over the place. And it's pretty well known in the boating community. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, a lot of the marinas do mm -hmm. uh, reach out on behalf of the boat owners to schedule pump outs for the boat owners. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's visible in the mooring field and the northern free anchorage area mm -hmm. where people mm -hmm. overnight. Right, right. So that's so one form of advertising. Yeah. We, we probably could do more, Susan, so maybe we could maybe discuss that further. Public service announcement? Yeah. Public yeah. service yeah, announcement yeah. on the radios okay. and things. That's a good idea. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's, let's continue that thought. And you know, just pump out boats. In general, well, you know, like in Sag Harbor and Southampton mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could put together a big public, you know, LNG and some stuff. Yeah, LNG, LTV, something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's keep that idea going. Paper. For the trustees to maintain clean water, yeah. <laughs> which is the big issue now. It's a good message. Clean we could put something on our website that's a little more <coughs> that's uh, good idea. well documented. Mm -hmm. So there's lots yeah, of ways I think we could mm -hmm. grassroots uh, get information. Get the contact information. It's a real for valuable service. Out there too. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. I'm just trying to, you, you do hail the pump out boat on channel, VHF channel 73. So that is the pump out boat hailing channel. VHF. F. 73. Whatever channel happened 73. to those signs? They were at the harbor entrance. We had them all over the place. Yeah, we had, 
plastic ones. Um, they were at every marina. They were the trustees supplied them? I think the town supplied them. We got them from the... Um, that was when the uh, whole... When we first the put them in. Went into place. Yeah. yeah, that's when we put, put That was put a real them. paradigm shift in thinking yeah. about how to manage... Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It might not be bad to have, you know, a harbor entrance sign with the channel that you notify for people mm -hmm. that come from. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. For the transient mm -hmm. visitors. Or someplace that mm -hmm. don't really know about this. Yeah. Really good idea. The people they just Do we give out notification about the pump out boat and the channel when we give them permits for um, mooring or dock docking? We can put include a flyer in the package. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Right. So we should talk about this some more. Okay. Maybe that's a harbor management committee. Um, yeah, initiative. Initiative. Right. Okay, minutes. Uh, we have the minutes from May 14th. Uh, I think I we wanted to give the other members who weren't at the last meeting a chance to weigh I in. I know that I had read them and I did approve. I thought they looked swell as usual. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Marlene. Right. Any other Sorry. comments on the 14th? I looked nope, at them. I, they, I didn't see anything that was uh, yeah, I looked at inaccurate. Them. We got a motion to get the minutes approved. I make a motion, a motion to approve. Yeah. Second that a motion. I love them. Hey. Second that a motion. Aye. 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 All right, passing carry. Uh, financial reports for the month ended April 30th. Well, I did have an opportunity to look at them, and um, <clears throat> we um, uh, actually. Uh, let me just think. Uh, didn't we put that off? I think we did. We did. Yeah, yeah. I want to yeah, make sure that everybody. That we, yeah, and we tabled it last week. Uh, yeah, I like to give everybody an opportunity to, you know, absorb what's going on financially. And uh, and and that being said, if there's no other, you know, questions or concerns, um, you know, I would make a motion that we accept uh, the financial report that we're speaking about, which uh, what ends in. The 30th of April, I believe. Mm -hmm. I'll second, second that. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Thank you. Okay, we have a renewal of the certificate of deposit ended in account number 6683. Uh, I think it's a standard rollover of the certificate. It, it, it is, but having said that, and, and I'm tempted to make a motion, but um, who is actually watching that to make sure that that isn't that? a fiduciary move in terms of the type of financial instrument that it is yeah relevant. where to put it um well certificates are a very safe form of mm -hmm. investment uh interest rates have gone up a little bit so we're probably earning a small amount of return okay um mm -hmm. you know depending on when the renewal date is mm -hmm. we may or may not have still an opportunity to look at that you know, if you want to look at like yields, I mean, I think CDs are the appropriate instrument to keep the money in. Right. But whether you go six month, twelve month, eighteen month, um, you know, will impact the return. So yeah, and I know, and if I you know. Want to take a look at that, Brian. We'd be happy to. Well, I, I, I your, yeah, your my, I have a suggestion. You know, I, I would motion or accept a motion. You know, that we allow this to be roll, rolled over. But I'd like the board to consider. Uh, having somebody uh, with some financial uh, background to make sure that uh, you know we are in fact putting our money where it's going to um, you know benefit us work for us the work best. For us the best. The most. Yeah. Would, would you yeah. like to maybe contact our CPA and have a brief discussion before the next meeting and just uh, I think it I think that would be a great idea. You know. I'm not sure of the date of this particular rollover, but I think uh, as Brian and and Rick Drew are saying, an overview of when the next one is coming up and where the best place and a whole schedule like we do with the permits that are expiring. Uh, you know, a, a whole overview that all the board can take a look at and discuss. Um, you know, this was probably put into motion, yeah. and it's conservative and it's smart, but um, it's, it could be time to review it. So we but should table this. Well, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't Dave table this. Be, no. Um, we'll, we'll, renew, oh, we'll renew this one. We'll and renew, already, look forward. It's a small amount. Renewals. He might have it in in there. I don't think it's a huge. Um, mm -hmm. No, I think we should try to move forward with this one. But as Brian points out, why don't we take a broader look yeah. at sure. future activities? And her. Do we Arlene, know? Do you know when the next one is going to come? No, through? but uh, Lori will be in the office tomorrow morning, and she handles. Uh, 
Is the RISM account also in the same form in the certificate of deposit, or is it an actual bank account itself? I think that's a money market. Money market fund? And it's something that has to be funded from time to time. Right. Because we take more out than actually yeah. goes into it. So. Okay. All right. And motion? Okay. Brian, you made a motion? No, I'll let somebody else. I'll make a motion. Okay. <laughs> I'll second it. You all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <coughs> I don't want to be emotional. <laughs> emotional talk? Emotional <What>? talk? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, report of the clerk. I really don't have anything particular to share this evening, so I'm going to uh, move into correspondence. We have a letter from Tom. Iwaneko of Vector Control advising us of the pesticide spraying schedule. And let's see here if we can. So we do have, well, this is already, I think, outdated applications for June 6th and 7th. So I'm sorry, we don't have anything looking forward. We have a, a I think later they go on. out. They go out on a regular basis. So I right. think you'll be, you'll be getting those every, every yeah, week. Just with our they my put you on the list. Schedule. Yeah, you're on. Yeah. So they, they spray yeah. weekly? In yeah, one, we discussed this a little bit today when we were on the marsh, and this is a little misleading because it gives you the impression that they're just spraying acabonic, like mm -hmm. the whole place. Right, right. And they're not really. They're just spraying areas that need it. And that's based on their sampler's assessment mm -hmm. of the day. So some, I'm not sure if it's in this report or if there's another report. It actually zeroes in on exactly where they sprayed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it's this spraying or the week before's, but uh, somebody was you know, citing a, re a report that they got that uh, indicated that only two hot spots in Akabonic were actually sprayed that week. So I, I'm not familiar with how they report, but it may be that they give out a generalized report of the harbors that they're going to spray or they sprayed that week. But there may be, may be in here, but there may be another more specif specific report where they say exactly where in the harbors yeah. that they did spray. So we can, I guess, request that or look further into that document and see if it's in there or request the uh, more they, specific Do they maybe document. post it online? If yeah, there is, a, there is a website. Why don't I share that with everyone? So you, you, yeah, you can go to www.suffolkcountyny.gov forward slash departments forward slash public works forward slash Vector mosquito control. Right. Well, you can probably just Google vector control. Yeah, <laughs> and you know we can probably put this link on our website, so that might be under our community outreach mm -hmm. chapter. That would so. be a great idea. Which is so not to be can... confused with the county correction facility, <laughs> <laughs> which is only one letter different. <laughs> okay, um, so we'll put that link up on the website. We also received a letter regarding deep water wind from uh, Assemblyman. Fred W. Field Jr. And I'd like to put this up on the trustee website also. So if any members of the it's quite yeah. lengthy. So it's it's quite good. Yeah, it's it's very so, detailed. So it'll be it'll be up on the website sometime this week, and uh, we have a whole chapter of information on deep water wind, and this will complement the other information that is up there. Okay. Does anyone else have anything to share with us this evening? I don't think so. Okay, can we get a motion? Motion, Make a motion to close. To close. Motion to close. Motion to close. Second. 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 Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What time is it, Susan? Quarter.